Good morning and shalom, everyone. Welcome to Acts Reformed Church. We are, study, we are starting our Sunday school class, which we begin at 9.45 a.m. And right now I am live streaming that on my personal Facebook page, which is I'm at my personal Facebook account, which is Johnny Gabriel Navarro. And I'm later going to upload this uh, particular Sunday school class. This one's going to be the first time I'm going to upload my, my uh, Sunday school class to two YouTube channels. One will be the Theology Zone. And the other will be for the Axe Reform Church YouTube channel. This is the first time I've uploading one of my videos to the Axe Reform Church YouTube channel, because of the name of this particular uh, son, uh, class is going to be the subject of becoming a church member, because there seems to have been some confusion. And so I wanted to help clarify. I was asked by Pastor Gerardo to do this. Uh, so the corporate worship starts at 10:30 a.m which we live stream on the Acts Reform Church Facebook page. That's ACTS Reform Church Facebook page, later to be uploaded to the Acts Reform Church YouTube channel. And if you would like to join us here at the church, uh, you, you are welcome to join us at 3528 East Temple Way, West Covina, California. Every week uh, in the Sunday schools that I've taught, I, I begin with the Sunday school prayer, the great Shema. It is a creedal statement. It is the, our commitment, our covenantal commitment, not just as Christians, but, but the Judeo-Christian tradition for thousands of years. And that is to say that we are committed to the one God, Yahweh. So if we could say it together in Hebrew and in English, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Echad, which is in English, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. So as I said, we're going to do a class on the subject of becoming a church member. This is not a membership class, and we do have on the Acts Reform Church face, uh, YouTube channel, we do have a playlist. I think it's two videos where Pastor Gerardo was teaching the membership class uh, last year. And so uh, this is going to be on the nature of what it means, how to become a member, and what that all entails. So I'm not going to get into a summary of the basic Christian beliefs, the doctrine of the Trinity, justific I'm not gonna get into all of those issues. That's for the membership class. So this is just on the subject of becoming a church member. The very idea of church membership is considered strange to many professing Christians today. They argue that accepting Jesus in your heart is all you need for salvation and be a part of the church. Hence, congregating with others is not important or required to be a Christian. However, a church is a local assembly of people, plural, and this confuses the biblical doctrine of sanctification with justification. As evangelicals, we believe we are justified by grace alone through faith alone, so we don't need to be a church member in order to be saved. But sanctification is the lifelong process by which we are becoming holy by being conformed to the image of Christ. For this we do require a church to belong to for the reception of the means of grace. But why? The scriptures teach that the church is the body of Christ, and as such, we are, spirit, we are a spiritual family. We are called to bear one another's burdens and to suffer and rejoice together. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 through 27. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. Galatians 6, 2. Bear one, another's, uh, bear one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. So we see a few points here. Number one, Jesus stated that he would build his church, Matthew 16, 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Number two, Jesus commanded the church to make disciples and baptize them, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep all that I commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Number three, the church has bishops, elders, pastors, and deacons, Philippians 1.1. Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ, Jesus who are in Philippi with the overseers, that's bishops, elders, pastors. Remember, as Reformed Baptists, and historians uh, acknowledge that the office of bishop, episcopus in Greek, elder, presbyteros in Greek, and pastor are all different words to describe the same office. So we do not see bishops as one thing, elders as another thing, and pastors as a separate thing. They're all the same thing. And then you have deacons. Uh, and one of the aspects of 
being a church, a church member is that when you, because you have to congregate, that's number one. And number two, the Bible also, and it's not in my notes, but the Bible also says that you have to congregate together. You, Paul, I'm sorry, the author of Hebrews mentions this in the book of Hebrews. And we also are to told that we are to submit to our elders. The, none of these things make any sense unless you are part of a local assembly in which you can be held in account. And in fact, uh, the Bible also says that the elders of the church are also, this is in Hebrews, that they are also to give an account. In other words, on judgment day, God is going to judge the elders, the, the leaders of the church, for how they shepherded their flock. So if you're a good elder, God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. If you are a bad elder, you will be judged for that as well. Paul wrote that we too, we took the sacrament when we come together as a church, 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen, 18. For in the first place, when you come together as a church. Now, the, the Greek word that's used in the word uh, come together is the Greek word sunerkomai, because I, one, of the, one of the aspects that I have experienced in talking to uh, people in general is that some people think that it's okay to you know, maybe grab a wafer and some grape juice or crackers and grape juice, and they can go in their house, and, and they could just say, okay, I'm taking the, the crackers and the grape juice, and therefore I'm taking the Lord's Supper just as Jesus commanded it. Well, uh, I would point out two things. The first is that the word church is not an individual, it's a group of people. Now, you can, you can speak of the church in certain contexts, whether it be in a sermon or, or just in everyday conversation, Bible study. You could talk about the individual Christian as representative of the church, or you can say that there are certain things that are said of the church that apply in a secondary sense to the individual as a Christian. But in this particular passage, what we have is a sacrament, an ordinance, a commandment that makes, this is, this is what we talk about, and I've talked about this in previous Sunday schools, and that is that the sacraments are a way of communicating the gospel in a physical form. So you have the word, so when you're preaching the gospel, when you're orally telling people, Jesus Christ lived the perfect life that we could not live, that he died offering himself as a sacrifice, as our high priest, and, and made the sacrifice that we could not make. And then he was buried, and then he rose from the dead on the third day, and he ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he is waiting to come back in order to judge the second coming, to judge the living and the dead, and to resurrect and to and do the final judgment and all of those things. And that is communicated in the gospel as you speak. So when you're speaking to the unbeliever, you've got to tell them all these things. Otherwise, you're not giving them the full counsel of God because the death, burial, and resurrection is, the, is what I like to call the, uh, the bare knuckles of the gospel itself without getting into all the nuances. But the, but the sacraments, when you speak of the, the baptism waters, the, ba the waters of baptism are communicating to us the very work of Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, and our spiritual death, burial, and resurrection as we rise with him, and which foreshadows our rising in the future. And then in the Lord's Supper, once again, we are reminded of what Jesus Christ did. That's why Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And these ordinances are church ordinances that we do as a congregation. Yes, there can be exceptions. Yes, if you're in a deserted island. Yes, if you're out in the mountains and, you know, there's always, you know, you die, you're in a plane crash. Obviously, you have those exceptions, but this is not talking about the exceptions. This is talking about Christians in their relationship to God as they follow God's commandments in church. And that's one of the things that in the Great Commission, it says, baptize in the name of the Father, teaching them all that I have commanded. And so when I look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 11, the word that is used to come together is a Greek word. It's, we see come together is two words in the English language, but in the Greek it's one word. The word is sunerkomai. And the word sunerkomai can refer to the coming together of a group of people. It could be a political thing, you know, like a political rally. It could be a family reunion or it could be a church gathering. It can also refer to a, a man and a woman coming together in marriage, even to the point of speaking of them in the marriage bed. So the word tunerkobai has a variety of contexts, but in this particular context, it's actually talking about the congregation of Jesus Christ coming together to worship together and to participate in the Lord's Supper. And in this passage, the word tunerkobai, by the way, is used about four times in 1 Corinthians 11 to emphasize you come together in church, in congregation. Uh, the ordinances 
uh, this is from Mark. Um, this is from Mark Dever's uh, and Jonathan Lehman's book on government for an anti-institutional age. He says the ordinances mark off a church's boundaries in the waters of baptism, then silently declare the congregation's source of life in the Lord's death at the table. The ordinances, in other words, make the membership visible, and church discipline occurs through the ordinances. And by the way, uh, Brother Deacon Ron is in the back with the microphone if anyone wants to add a comment or ask a question. Number five, the whole church is involved in major decisions, such as uh, choosing the elders and the bishops, Acts 14.23. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having played, prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now, there are... There are different contexts in which you might have a situation where a church is planting another church and they send uh, an elder to that church. Those are, those are, uh, th that's basically the genesis of how churches are planted by other churches. However, when uh, a church is thinking about growing the church, the most normal and common way, especially in the early church, I, I remember when I was at a previous church, they had imported a, a pastor from another church out of state. There's nothing wrong with doing that per se, but obviously in the ancient world, we weren't going to be importing people from another continent or another state because transportation was very difficult back then, and it took a very, very long time, whereas today you can travel by plane and be here in a matter of hours. Uh, so the Didache also describes how the church appointed elders slash bishops slash pastors. Uh, this is from chapter 15 of the Didache, which is an ancient document from the late 1st, early 2nd century, which describes it. It was understood to be the teaching of the apostles that was written by the apostles, but uh, more, most serious historians don't actually believe the apostles wrote it. But it does reflect at least what the Christians of that time believe. Therefore, appoint for yourselves bishops and deacons worthy of the Lord, men who are humble and not avaricious and true and approved, for they too carry out for you the ministry of the prophets and teachers. Of course, this also gets into the, the requirements for bishop or elder slash pastor, which is also found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, so we, we, you guys can get into that in a, in a membership class. It is all, the church is also involved in choosing deacons. Acts 6, 3 through 6. Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we may put in the charge of this need. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the service of the word, and his word pleased the whole congregation. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenens, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, and these they stood before the apostles after praying, they laid their hands on them. So you notice that the pattern is that when you're bringing people into the, to become officers of the church, and notice that the, the offices are two, bishop slash elder slash pastor and deacon, two offices. And one of the, uh, one of the aspects that we talked about in a previous Sunday school is the uh, the evolution and the development of the monarchical episcopate. This is the idea that you have one bishop overseeing a plurality of elders, which you see uh, in Ignatius of Antioch in the second century. They say that some historians say that this may have developed by the year 110 or so. Uh, but we see that in the Bible, this is not how things operated in the biblical period. And uh, we, we, if we want to have a biblical approach to this, we could do that. But one of the things that happens now, church government itself is not a gospel issue. So if you believe in a, if you believe in a, a monarchical episcopate, such as our, our, um, our, I'm sorry, our Anglican brothers do, and I believe our Lutheran brothers have a concept of that as well, uh, that's not a salvation issue. But the question is, are we governing our church in the biblical model? <clears throat> and we as Reformed Baptists argue that the biblical model is to follow a, a plurality of elders who are the, themselves also bishops. Yes. What was your comment right now? You said it's not a what issue? It's not a gospel issue. So. Now, how about uh, women deacons versus male deacons? I would say that that is a much more serious issue, uh, but I would not say that a church that has women deacons and women pastors, my personal opinion, <clears throat> I would not say that they're heretical because they do preach the gospel, but I do believe that that is an unhealthy way. And one of the reasons is, is because when you give uh, a certain authority, let's say you have a woman pastor, the question is because in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says that the bishop is to be the head of the household and he's supposed to, he's supposed to have his household in order. 
But the Bible also says that women are, are not supposed to be, uh, be over men. And it also says that women are supposed to be submissive to their husband. If the woman is the bishop, in what way is she being submissive? Is she being submissive at home but not at church? So th that's where you get into the imbalances. And so though it, this is a serious, serious issue, I would not say that people that do that are not Christians or, or not safe. So let me take it a step further. So would you say, though, a church that has an elder pastor as a female is even a more serious issue because it's a slippery slope. You're saying, well, it's yes. not, it's a big issue, but it's not a gospel issue for deacons, but yet the qualifications for deacons, other than the issue of teaching, is relatively the same as an elder. Exactly. That, that's why I said the same thing about if you have a woman pastor, uh, you, is she being submissive at home but not at church? That's where you have the unhealthy imbalance. But what, what I'm saying is that obviously I'm very much against it, but are they teaching the gospel? Are, they're not denying the Trinity. They're not denying the atonement of Jesus Christ. They're not denying the resurrection. They have an unhealthy, unbiblical church government. And I mean, if they want to defend themselves, they can defend themselves. And I mean, wouldn't the argument be made, though, that it's a complete disobedience to the word of God, just openly, yes, just straight but, up? But it's the same thing with baptism. If baptismal regeneration is true, we're being disobedient. If infant baptism is true, then we're being disobedient. So it goes, it's a... It's, well, I think there's a difference. Slope. One is very clear in Scripture if you look at the qualifications of an elder versus the issue of baptism. That, that depends on what end of the spectrum you are on. If you talk to a Lutheran, they would say that baptismal regeneration is very clear in the Bible. You're talking to Wilson saying that too. <laughs> but just to go back to the question about uh, women holding the position there, yeah. I, I would just say that while they are in disobedience to the scripture, the ones being held in, to account, right, although the women are in sin, is the men. Shame yeah. on the men, and they are the ones responsible for women usurping the place of a uh, of leadership. Yes. And, and also, the, the, I would say the same thing about churches. There are churches that are governed by a committee. And then you have, I, I remember, I'm not going to name the church, but there was a church that where the, the pastor of the church, uh, his wife had been unfaithful to him. And that resulted in him getting a divorce from said wife. And then he remarried. But he never stepped down from ministry. Now, I'm not saying that he was necessarily at fault, although there, an argument can be made that there was some fault to be, to be shared there. But the issue is that the church decided that he could stay as a pastor. And uh, a brother had said to him, Pastor so-and-so, the Bible says that your household has to be in order. You, you, you need to step down. And the pastor said, well, the committee said it was okay. And so this is an example of an unhealthy because the committee, they're not, uh, this, the, word, the concept of a committee is not a biblical concept. It's elder, bishops and, elder, and deacons. So this is where we're, we're getting back to basics and going back to the New Testament. But like I said, is that particular church, and I'm not going to name the church, but I know which church it is, is that church a heretical church? Do they not have the gospel? Are they not born again Christians here? Yeah, they are Christians, uh, and they're part of a major denomination. But as I said before, this is an issue of where there is a serious error. In other words, there, there are Bible-believing sound churches who are in serious error. For, oh, let's take, for example, the church, uh, the Corinthians. Uh, Pastor Gerardo right now is in a sermon series on the first letter to the Corinthians. What were they guilty of? They had a man, they, there was a man that was having sex with his stepmother. You had them arguing with each other, challenging the authority of Paul. There were people there, if you get to, once you get to 1 Corinthians 15, there were people there that were denying the resurrection of the dead. Yet that church was still a true church. There were heretics in the church, but the church itself is still a true church. And he even says that these are, there are people that are Christians, that are born again, that are sanctified. But he talks about how immature they were. So you can be a very defective very flawed congregation with some serious, serious problems as First Corinthians, as Paul uh, leads. In fact, Paul writes two, maybe three letters to Corinth, and then Clement, years later, writes yet another letter because they had deposed all the elders. And so there, there's some serious, serious problems, but yet Corinth is still a church. As, as, uh, as flawed as it is, it's still a church. Uh, so they, they appoint people for ministry tasks. Uh, Acts 15.22, then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them 
uh, Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among others to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. 2 Corinthians 8, 18 and 19. And we have sent along with him, brother, whose praise is in, in the things of the gospel is throughout the churches. And not only this, but he has also been appointed by the churches to travel with us in this gracious work that is being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our readiness. Number six. The church members collectively vote as a majority on the punishment of members who fall into sin. 2 Corinthians 5-7 through But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much to all of you. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority. Notice I capitalized punishment and majority. So that on the contrary, you should rather graciously forgive and comfort him lest such a one be swallowed up by excessive sorrow. Some would suggest that this is the man from 1 Corinthians 5, but there's a discussion about that among uh, theologians. Uh, Matthew 18, 15 through 18. Now, if your brother sins, go and show him his fa fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, any fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, that's a congregation of plurality of people, let him be to you as the Gentile and the tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. This is the church act practicing church discipline. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5, this is the man we spoke of. It, uh, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and sexual immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. And you have become puffed up and have not mourned instead so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of the Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So the, the excommunication which Paul is describing here, the purpose is to restore him uh, if God grants him repentance. Obviously, 2 Timothy 2.25. How does the church receive new members into the church? In the apostolic period, a convert would be baptized immediately and welcomed into the church by the members. Acts 2.41, so then those who had received his word were baptized, and, they had, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Romans 6.3, or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So we see that we are united to Christ and you're united to the congregation through our baptism. The pamphlet from Rose Publishing states, Committed Christians interpret baptism in different ways, but most Christians agree that baptism is central to the Christian faith, is not optional, but a commandment, is often a way for people to show in public their commitment to God, unifies Christians as members of the same body, as no ultimate, has no ultimate significance apart from faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Everett Ferguson, in his research on the early church's view of baptism, states, Baptism is the act that introduces a person into the one body, the church. Baptism in the early church, this is from his book, Baptism in the Early Church. Uh, Hippolytus of Rome, uh, in his book uh, on the apostolic tradition, he states, uh, And so each one, after drying himself off, this is after baptism, is immediately clothed and then is brought into the church. This is not a building, this is a congregation. So like one of the concerns that I had was last year, and I actually spoke with uh, Brother Kelvin and his wife, uh, Sister Ella, is that last year we had a membership class, uh, and uh, the membership class was taught by Pastor Gerardo. Uh, sorry, baptism class that was taught by ba ba Pastor Gerardo. And then we received several members to be, several individual Christians to be baptized into the church, but none of them were actually members. That baptism video, by the way, has received now 61,000 views on YouTube. So it's been very uh, faith promoting and it has actually brought new subscribers and more attention. It's increased the outreach of Acts Reformed Church. So praise God for that. But Sister Ella was one, the one person who took the baptism class, got baptized, but was not a member. Then later on, uh, they, the, the church decided, okay, we need to have a membership class. And we had two individual candidates that, that took the class. And then, of course, they were received into the membership of the church. And one of the things I asked, well, wait a minute. Did she want to get baptized but not become a member? And I wasn't sure how that process worked. Because historically, when a person wants to get baptized, it's because they want to belong to a church. So when that person 
joins the church and starts attending the church and says, you know, I confess Jesus as my, my Savior and my Lord, and I want to go to church and I want to serve him and all of those things. And they say, all right, well, let's put you on the membership class. Have you been baptized? No? Okay, well, let's go through the membership class. And once you have uh, taken the membership class and the church has vetted your testimony and all of that, then as a, as a result of that, they will vote you in and then you will be received through your baptism. So here's, a, here's some historical overview. Uh, Jonathan Lehman outlines that baptism is the initiation in the membership of the visible covenant community, the church. The first step of the Christian life is baptism. Always, it's a given with these folks. Repent and be baptized, Acts 2.38. Those who accepted his message were baptized, Acts 2.41. But when they believed, Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women, Acts 8.12. Scales fell from Saul's eyes. He, he he got up and was baptized, Acts 19.18. Then immediately he and all the household were baptized, Acts 16.33. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized, Acts 18.8. And now what are you waiting Get up for? Get up and be baptized, wash, wash your sins away, calling on his name, Acts 22.16. It is hardly surprising that Paul, writing to the church in Rome, simply assumes that all his leaders, I'm sorry, all his readers had been baptized, Romans 6.3. This public identity marker is just a given. Puritan John Owen, again, uh, John Owen adds, Again, by being baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, we are sacredly initiated and consecrated or dedicated unto the service and worship of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This we take upon us in our baptism. Herein lies the foundation of all our faith and profession with the engagement of ourselves unto God, which constitutes our Christianity. This is the pledge of our entrance into the covenant with God and of our, living, of our giving up ourselves unto him in the solemn bond of religion. There are diverse perspectives within evangelicalism on the topic, but the relationship between baptism and church membership are held in common. Question 14 of the Anglican Catechism states, What should we do as the sign of your repentance and faith? After receiving instruction in the faith, I should be baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, thus joining his body, the church. I have already been baptized. I should confess my sins, seek the guidance of the minister, affirm the promises made at my baptism, and take my place as a member of the church. And there's some verses right there from the Anglican Catechism. The Baptist Faith and Message, 2000, Article 7, on Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, this is the Southern Baptist Convention's confession. Christian baptism is the immersion of a believer in water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It is an act of obedience symbolizing the believer's faith in a crucified, buried, and risen Savior. The believer's death to sin, the burial of the old life, and the resurrection to walk in newness of life in Christ Jesus. It is a testimony to his faith in the final resurrection of the dead being a church ordinance. It is a prerequisite to the privileges of church membership and to the Lord's Supper. This is, of course, you don't have to necessarily agree with every nuance, but at least understand that baptism is understood as the initiation, is what brings you in. The doorway is what I would, what I would call it. Luther and Charles Lehman explains, in baptism, the newly baptized has become a child of God and a member of God's family as a fellow members of that family. The congregation welcomes him or her as, a, as a, the newest of its members. Now, of course, Lutherans believe in baptismal regeneration, so you got to see that as an element of that. Lutheran Galen Friedrich states that through baptism we have been brought into the church. We know that we are members of God's holy and eternal family because we have been baptized. Presbyterian John Jefferson Davis points out that the baptized infants become members of the church. So this is a covenantal view rather than the baptismal regeneration view of the Lutherans. So Presbyterians, infant baptism, according to this understanding, not only are adult converts to be baptized, but also the infant children of one of or both believing parents. Baptism of the infant is understood as a sign of the covenant signifying membership in the visible people of God. This is the church. Reformed Baptist Jim Sevastio and Mike Renahan state that there is also in Scripture a corporate nature to baptism, showing union with the people of God. Baptism is a gateway into the fellowship of the local church. This is from the New Exposition of the London Baptist Confession of Faith. Reformed Baptist Sam Waldron points out that discipleship, baptism, and church membership are intimately connected in the Great Commission. Discipleship, therefore, demands baptism, church membership, and submission to the elders, teachers of the church. Church membership presupposes and demands discipleship manifesting itself in the obedience to the Lord. Obedience manifested specifically in the acts of baptism and submission to the word in the teaching ministry of the church. Baptism is not to be divorced from discipleship and church membership. Uh, and this is uh, from the, the, the same book, um, uh, by Rob Ventura. Jeremy M. Kimball states, Baptism is the initiating oath sign of the new covenant, and the Lord's Supper serves as a renewing oath sign of the new covenant. 
there are no unbaptized members of the church in the New Testament, as biblical scholar F.F. F. Bruce writes, the idea of an unbaptized believer does not seem to be entertained in the New Testament. As heresies developed in, early in the early church, the need to properly catechize new converts became necessary. Jeremy M. Kimball again states, in the earliest New Testament churches, one sees that baptism and church membership apparently followed close on the heels of conversion. However, according to second century sources such as the Didache and the works of Justin Martyr by the mid-second century, conversion and baptism were separated by a period of moral instruction, prayer, and fasting. The separation between conversion and baptism led to two classes of membership, baptismal candidates and full communicant members. While baptismal candidates were not allowed to participate in communion, which was received by full communicant members, they were required to attend church services and were subject to church discipline. This two-tiered approach to membership continued and progressed throughout this era of church history. In fact, the pre-baptismal baptism probationary period expanded to such a degree that some patristic sources call for a period of up to three years prior to being able to join as a full member. These prospective baptismal candidates, now referred to as catechumens, were held to the same standards and restrictions as previously, uh, as previously, but obviously for a greater length of time. John S. Hammett explains, one such requirement could be the completion of a class. This is for membership. Such classes, called variously new Christian classes or new members classes, are becoming more common in Baptist churches today and bear some resemblance to the catechumenate of the early church a time when new converts were, were taught the basic elements of the Christian faith before and as preparation for baptism. Among many Baptist groups outside North America, such classes are standard. They serve several important purposes. They provide a natural context for new prospective members to meet others and develop relationships. They provide an opportunity to introduce these individuals to the various ministries of the church. Most important, they provide a context for discussion of each individual's spiritual condition for a key component of such classes should be a review of each person's understanding of the gospel. Even those coming from other churches need to be uh, given the opportunity of sharing how they came to know Christ and how they understood the gospel. For in some churches, the gospel is not clearly explained. For those coming as new converts and requesting baptism, such a review of the gospel is essential. How serious are we about practicing believers' baptism if we do not even ask those uh, seeking baptism if they are believers? And sadly, in today's theological climate, we need to be a bit more specific asking them what they believe and how they came to know Christ. Once prospective new members have completed this class, those who conducted the class can re recommend, I'm sorry, rec recommend admitting them to baptism and or church membership, and based on such a recommendation, members can vote with some confidence. I know of cases where prospective new members were converted in the new members class and other cases where prospective new members came to understand the gospel for the first time in the new members class and rejected it. They had responded emotionally to a gospel message in a worship service, but when they understood the, co the commitment involved in trusting Christ, they were unwilling. It is far better to know and reject the gospel than to be baptized and think one is somewhat, somehow safe without ever coming to an understanding of the gospel or what it means to place saving faith in Jesus Christ. This is from John S. Hammond. In conclusion, we must see, based on scripture and history, that church members are prayerfully, cho to, uh, prayerfully choose by vote who will be, be brought into or removed from the membership of the church with the exceptions of member resignation and death. As Credo Baptists, we teach that the New Covenant only has spiritually reborn members. As such, candidates must be catechized until the church receives them through the initiatory rite of baptism into New Covenant church membership. Sean B. Wright points out. However, the New Testament never speaks in the categories of communicant and confederate members. Believers, uh, and this is in his book, Believer's Baptism. So communicant members are those who participate in the Lord's Supper, and confederate members are those who cannot participate, part, partake of the Lord's Supper. Wright adds, the New Testament does not speak in the categories of non-communion members, no need, I'm sorry, non-communing members who need to confess Christ and become full church members. This is an ongoing debate between Pado and Credo Baptists, of course. We must not ignore or minimize the importance of this doctrine and why we disagree on it. However, this is not a gospel issue that we should divide over with fellow brothers. Christians should unite in love and learn from brothers with different church polity in the gospel. But we are, as congregants do have the responsibility to clarify how church membership is to function in our local assembly. And uh, with that, uh, does anyone have any comments or questions before I close? 
Okay. All right. So I just wanted to let everybody know that it has been a privilege to be a member of this church and to be teaching Sunday school classes. Uh, it's been a, a huge blessing for myself, and I hope that it's been at least some sort of benefit for any of the people that are here. I'm just letting the church know that this is my last day as a member. As, long as, my, as well as my mother, we will be leaving the church to go to a church that is closer to our home. But uh, we just want to say thank you to all of you for letting me be here for the privilege of being a part of this spiritual family. This is not a goodbye. We are going to visit from time to time, and we want to maintain communication. So I just want to say thank you to all of you, and God bless all of you. Father God, thank you so much for all that you have done. Thank you for the blessing of this church. We, we hope that this church continues to grow and to, to be strengthened and uh, not only grow in numbers, but grow spiritually and that they may grow in maturity and that all, all of the uh, challenges that are ahead, that they may be able to face them uh, with your Holy Spirit's power. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you.